Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for intermediate algebra. This is section 7.5, which is the graphs of quadratic function. And before we get started, I'm actually going to kind of tell you that this is a section that students do find challenging because it is a lot of information. And there's an introduction to new uh, standard forms of quadratics and new formulas that we have to commit to memory. So hopefully, we'll take our time with this uh, video and truly understand more about the graphs of quadratic functions. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to look at is what we call the library function of a quadratic. This is f of x equals x squared. This is what we call one of our library functions. And it's something that as you move on in math, you'll become more familiar with and something that we'll return to in chapter 9. So this is uh, the quadratic function f of x equals x squared. And every parabola has this general shape. It kind of looks like a u. If we were to graph different values for x and uh, we'd get different outputs for y or f of x, we get this shape for every parabola. It kind of looks like a u. And that's what we call it is a parabola. So the shape of this, which looks like a u, is a parabola. One of the defining things of every parabola is that we can define its vertex. Every parabola has a vertex. And the vertex is either the lowest point or the highest point on the graph. And if we look at this one, we can see that f of x equals x squared has its vertex, or in this case, its lowest point at the origin. Well, that point is 0, 0. So the vertex is just the highest or lowest point of a parabola. Now, the axis of symmetry, every parabola has an axis of symmetry. If we look at this and just kind of assess what's happening here, because it's centered on the y-axis, anything to the right is reflected to anything to the left. This is symmetry. Any point over here is the same distance as the point over here. And that's called symmetry. And hopefully, we understand symmetry. But what we're looking for the, is the axis of symmetry. What is this value? Well, this value here is a vertical line at x equals 0 for this particular parabola. So the axis of symmetry is essentially the equation of a vertical line, in this case, where x equals 0. x equals 0 is the y-axis. Now, <clears throat> if we were to if we were asked to find the intercepts, what we do is basically look where it crosses the x-axis or the y-axis. For this library function of a parabola, it crosses at the origin, which we've already determined is the uh, vertex, but the origin. So it has an x-intercept of 0, 0. To find an x-intercept, we put, plug 0 in for y. We set the equation equal to 0. Well, what squared would equal 0? 0 squared. It also shares the same value for its y-intercept. This will not always be the case because uh, it'll cross at a different point if we had a different quadratic function. But to find a y-intercept, if we recall, we'd plug 0 in for x. Well, 0 squared is 0, so y would be 0. So this is the only time where they actually share an x and y intercept is when it passes through the origin, as this example does. Now, how do we find x-intercepts of functions when they're uh, maybe not the library function like this one? Maybe it's moved somewhere else on the graph. Well, when we're looking for the zeros of a function, that's just saying, where is the function equal to 0? We set it equal to 0. And we've done that before in all the previous sections of this chapter. We solved quadratic equations. Well, if we set this equal to 0, we're finding the zeros. This is the tool we use to find x-intercepts. So the zeros are defined as the x-intercepts. Where is the function equal to 0? Now, one thing we have to keep in mind is when we solve quadratics, there were times where we'd get real solutions. So we'd have real zeros. The real zeros of a function are 
the x-intercepts. But what happens when we have complex zeros or complex solutions to this equation, f of x equals 0? Well, they're still zeros. They're only complex zeros. And what we have to keep in mind is complex zeros do not result in x-intercepts. It tells me that there would be no x-intercepts. So we can find the zeros of a function. And this is why we introduce this term of zeros. Zeros, if they're real, are the same thing as x-intercepts. If they're complex, it tells me something about its graph. It tells me that it does not cross the x-axis if it has complex zeros. All right, let's look at this function here. We have f of x equals x squared minus 5x minus 14. If we want to find its zeros, we essentially just set the function equal to 0. And then we'd use our quadratic methods in order to solve this. Well, I look at this and I identify that, you know what, this does factor. There are factors of negative 14 that have a difference of 5. And that would be x minus 7 and x plus 2. So to find the zeros, I use that zero value theorem. And I find uh, when x is 7, 7 minus 7 would be 0. 0 times anything is 0. When x is 7, the function is 0. And that's an ordered pair. And that's a real value. So this is actually an x-intercept. We also have a 0 where x is negative 2. And if this is negative 2, negative 2 plus 2 is 0. 0 times anything is 0. We get the function's value of 0. So we get the ordered pair negative 2, 0. These, because the values are real, these zeros result in x-intercepts. So by finding the zeros of the function, I'm able to determine that if I were to graph this, it would have x-intercepts of 7, 0, and negative 2, 0. And maybe we'd want to sketch a graph of this. And I know a parabola has that u shape. It has 7, 0 as one of its x-intercepts, negative 2, 0 as one of its x-intercepts. And it has that general shape of a u. So now. I can say, well, I sketched the graph of this. This is what this function would look like on the graph. And maybe I could uh, find this point here just to find an extra intercept. Because this just said find the intercepts. Well, these are the x. What about the y's? Well, if we recall, to find a y-intercept, we would set x to 0. Well, that's easy enough. If this is 0 and that's 0, we get negative 14. So I was able to find all of my intercepts. The x-intercepts by finding the zeros of the function, and the y-intercept by setting x equal to 0 and solving for y. Now, let's explore a few more things and maybe tie two concepts together here. Here we have a function. And it is quadratic because we have an x term squared. But it's not in the form that we're used to. We're usually seeing quadratics in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c. Here it's not in that form. And we'll explain this form a little bit later. But if we want to find the vertex, let's compare the two graphs. Here we have the graph of this function in the orange color here. And we have the graph of the standard function, f of x equals x squared, or the library function of a parabola. We have that in white here. If we just assess the two, well, we know the axis of symmetry is this value here for our library function, x squared. It is x equals 0. If we look at this one, we can see an axis of symmetry that is symmetric about the value of x equals negative 1. So x equals negative 1 is our axis of symmetry for this particular parabola. Now, the vertex is the lowest point. That's this value right here. And I can see on this graph it would be at negative 1 and positive, set, or, yeah, positive 7. So the vertex is negative 1 
for the x value right here, and positive 7 for the y. Now, if we just assess the way this is written, we can see that, well, I see a 1 here next to the x value here, x plus 1. And my axis of symmetry is x equals negative 1. One thing that we'll find when parabolas are written in this form is that the axis of symmetry is always the opposite of the value we see in these parentheses. So if I see x plus 1, I know its axis of symmetry will be x equals negative 1. That vertical line is its axis of symmetry. Another thing we notice about the vertex, that negative value, I see a positive 1 there. Negative 1 is that axis of symmetry. This value is uh, the y value, the f of x value, of the vertex. It's up 7 here, positive in uh, the y direction to the value of 7. So when it's written in this form, I don't have to have the graph. I can just look at the function and say, well, the vertex is the opposite of what I see in here and this value for the y. x, y is the point of the vertex, in this case, the lowest point. So this is a useful form of the equation because I can determine more from it in this form without having to have the graph. Now, if we assess that same concept with the standard function, what am I adding or subtracting to x here? 0. Well, I have an axis of symmetry at x equals 0. What am I adding or subtracting after I square it? Well, 0. That's the y value of the vertex, 0, 0. And as we explored in the first example, that was the vertex of this library function f of x equals x squared. All right, let's look and explore that concept a little more. We're used to seeing quadratics in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c, where we know a, b, and c are just coefficients, not equal to 0. Or well, b and c could essentially be 0, but not a, because we have to have a squared term in order to have a quadratic. So if it's in this form, we can work with it to find values. We know how to work with quadratics. But when it's in this form, f of x equals a times the quantity of x minus h. And that's why I said it's always the opposite of what we see in there, because of that subtraction. That quantity is squared plus k. Well, h and k, when it's written in this form, is the vertex value. So I can look at it and say, well, it's negative h is what I see in there. h is the value I want for my vertex. And this value outside of those parentheses, k, is the y value of the vertex. x equals h is our axis of symmetry, as we've seen in the last example there, where x equals the opposite of what I see in there. I can take that value. That is the axis of symmetry. A few other things that when it's written, written in this form, it tells me if a is greater than 0, it's a parabola that opens up. It's a parabola that looks like our library function did. It opened up. Now, when it opens up, the k value is a minimum value. Of the vertex, we see that's the lowest point, the lowest point is when the function equals k. That is the lowest point in the y value, up or down. That would be the lowest. And we call that the minimum. If a is less than 0, well, that just means it opens down. And that just what we say when a is less than 0 is if this coefficient is a negative. Negative values mean instead of being a value that opens up like this, that looks like a u, it looks like an upside down u. It just opens down. Now, when it opens down, the k value of the function is a maximum. It is the highest point. So if a is positive, k is the lowest point. If a is negative, k is the highest point. So we have a high point or a low point, depending on the sign of a. Another thing that this graph can tell me is if the absolute value of a were which essentially means we're going to ignore the sign for a moment. If a is greater than 1, that means that the parabola is narrower. Let's for a moment go back to this one and look at this function. Here, 
this value is my a value. It is greater than 1, which means that this graph is narrower than my library function. It's skinnier uh, than the library function. If that value is less than 1, that means it's going to be wider. So instead of being a narrow parabola, it's a wider parabola. So we just look, well, what does it mean to be less than 1? Well, it's between 1 and 0, essentially, which means maybe it's a fraction or a decimal, some value less than 1. Okay? That's, wide, that's a wider version of our standard library function. All right, let's look at an example. And it is written in our standard parabola form, not our standard quadratic form. What we want to find is the vertex. Well, to determine the vertex, I don't need a graph. I can just look at this and say, well, the h value is the opposite of what I see in here. I see a positive 4. So my h value of my vertex is negative 4. Out here, the y value, uh, well, we'll get to that. The k value is negative 3. It is what I see, negative 3. So this has a vertex of negative 4, negative 3. If I want to determine its axis of symmetry, I know that the axis of symmetry is always that vertical line of x equals the h value. Well, x equals negative 4. That's going to be my axis of symmetry. Now, if I want to sketch the graph, this is all the information I really know or need to know is the vertex, the axis of symmetry, and whether it opens up or down. Let's determine that. Does it open up or down? Well, the coefficient out front here, the a value, is negative. So that tells me that it's going to open down. I'm going to have some u shape that's opening down. And it has a coefficient of 1. So since it's equal to 1, it's the same width as my library function. Now, with that information, I'm ready to graph it. So I'm going to plot this point. This is the vertex, negative 4, negative 3. So 1, 2, 3, 4. And then I go down 3, 1, 2, 3. That's going to put me right here. Now, I know that it opens down. So from this point, the vertex, this is going to open down. Now, I didn't draw too much of the graph, because if this is my graph with units of 1 here, it's way down here. So there's really not much I can do here uh, on the graph. I can't see much. It's a good thing that when it's in this form, I understand its shape and its behavior and what it's doing. I can look at A and say it's opening down. It's the same width as my uh, library function. It has a vertex of negative 4, negative 3. Now, the question I have here is, does the function have a maximum or minimum value? If it opens down, this is the highest value in y. So it has a maximum. It's the highest value of y. So we know it has a maximum. And what is the minimum or maximum value? Well, we already determined it's a maximum, and its value is k. Well, the k we've already determined to be negative 3. So it has a maximum when f of x equals negative 3. So we've answered the question. And this maximum value occurs at the axis of symmetry, the h value. So we get a maximum of negative 3 when x is negative 4. All right, let's look at what we can do with quadratic functions that are in this form. When we can put them into this form, it can tell us more information about its graph and its behavior. Um, the tool that we can use to change it from this form, the standard for a quadratic, to a standard for a parabola is to complete the square. Hopefully, we recall how to do that. We did cover that earlier in uh, this chapter. So to complete the square, if we recall, we'd have to isolate the variable terms. Well, to do that, I'd have to subtract 6 from both sides. But now, this isn't a 0. This is some function value. So we have to leave it as it is. But I'm still going to use the properties of equality. I'm going to subtract 6 from both sides. So if I subtract uh, 6 from f of x, this side of the equation, 
I would have to subtract 6 from this side of the equation. And so subtracting 6, it goes away. I just essentially moved it across the equal sign. Now to complete the square, this coefficient has to be 1. Instead of dividing through, because I don't want to uh, change this function, it, instead of dividing through by a negative 2, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor it out of these x terms. That way, it's still on the right side of the equation. And this coefficient is 1. And if we recall, when completing the square, the coefficient of the x squared term has to be 1. So now I'm ready to complete the square. If I recall, I take uh, 1 half of b quantity squared. And I'll write it right over here, 1 half of b squared. That's the tool we use to complete the square. So my b value within these parentheses is a negative 1. So I'm going to take half of negative 1, which is a negative 1 half. And then I'm going to square this value. And that's going to give me a positive 1 fourth. And if we recall when completing the square, once we found this value, we add it to both sides of the equation. So I need to add. 1 fourth to this side, or excuse me, add 1 fourth within those parentheses. And here's where we have to be careful. I just changed the right side of the equation by adding a fourth. If I added a fourth, what's in those parentheses is being multiplied by the a value out here that negative 2. So how much did I change the equation by? If I added a fourth, but I'm going to multiply it by negative 2, I actually change the equation by negative 2 times that 1 fourth, which would be negative 2 fourths, which is a negative half. I change this side of the equation by a negative 1 half. If I change this side by a negative 1 half, I have to do the same to this side. What you do to one side, you do to the other. So I need to subtract 1 half from this side. So if I add a quarter, when I complete the square, here's where uh, we might struggle. This is an additional step that we have to be aware of. This coefficient is multiplied by that. That's how much we're changing it by. So now I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, recombination. Negative 6 minus 1 half. Well, negative 6 would be negative 12 halves. Negative 12 halves minus 1 more half would be negative 13 halves. But now that I completed the square, this is a perfect square. What does this factor to? Well, it's going to factor to the work we did right here. What's in these parentheses before I square it is what it will always factor to, x and a negative 1 half. Now we're almost there. We have one more step to complete, and it will be in this form. And essentially, that's just getting f of x by itself again. I can add 13 halves to both sides. So f of x equals negative 2 times x minus 1 half quantity squared plus 13 halves. Now, if we look at this and assess, I can determine this is my a value. The opposite of this is my k value or h value, excuse me, and this is the k value. So we have a, h, and k. And now I can determine everything I need to know about the behavior of this graph. Well, the first thing I want to know is what's the vertex. I see a negative 1 half, so I know that the h value is the opposite, a positive 1 half. The k value is what it is. It's a 13 halves, so I've determined the vertex. I can now determine the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry is always x equals the h value, that vertical line. x equals the h value of 1 half. I can tell whether the graph opens up or it opens down. I can look at a. a is a negative value, so it opens down. It's a u shape that opens down. Does it have a maximum or minimum? Well, if it opens down, the highest point is the vertex, so it is a maximum. 
And then I can determine what are those values. What is the value of that maximum? Well, that is the k value. f of x equals 13 halves. That is the highest y value of this function. Where does this value occur? Well, it occurs when x equals the h value, 1 half. So the vertex tells me the maximum output and the uh, minimum at which that occurs, the input for that value. All right, so this was a lot of work. And hopefully, it was good review for completing the square. But there's an easier way. And it's because of that tool of completing the square that we have something called the vertex formula. So we're going to explore the vertex formula. If I were to complete the square on the uh, general or standard form of a quadratic, this is what I would get. I'd get f of x equals a times the quantity of x plus b over 2a quantity squared plus negative b squared plus 4ac divided by 4a. And if we look at this, we want to determine the vertex. Believe it or not, this is in this form here. The h value is the opposite of what I see here in these parentheses being squared. It's the opposite, so it's going to be a negative over 2a. So the vertex's h value is negative b over 2a. Its k value is what I'm adding to the function. Well, here it's negative b squared plus 4ac all divided by 4a. That's kind of messy. Now, if we think about it in terms of a formula, this is a formula that I could memorize. Well, h is this value, and k is this mess here, negative b squared plus 4ac all divided by 4a. That is too much to memorize, honestly. But this, the h value, well, that's not so bad, negative b over 2a. Well, what we have to realize is hk, the vertex, is nothing more than a point on the graph. Well, if it's a point on the graph and we have the function, if I plug in an input, an x value, which h is an x value, its output will give me k. So what I can do, instead of writing this whole formula in here, is I can say, if I evaluate the function for h, the k value is whatever the output is. When I plug it in, I'm going to find k. So the vertex formula is essentially this right here. Instead of writing this and this, this is all I have to rem remember. Negative b over 2a is the tool that I can use. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. You already know this value. You've already memorized this value once. So let's take a look at the, uh, the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula says x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Now, you've already memorized this. This was in a previous section. If you've worked with quadratics before, you know this formula. Well, if we look at this formula, we have negative b over 2a. Well, we know that h is the axis of symmetry. This is our axis of symmetry. Well, Negative b over 2a is the h value. This is our axis of symmetry. If I add or subtract to it, I go to the right or to the left. And if we think about a parabola, and this is its axis of symmetry, if I add a value, I can get to my graph. If I subtract a value, I can get back to my graph, plus or minus this value here. This is your axis of symmetry, negative b over 2a. Here we have negative b over 2a. You've already memorized that portion once before. So it's nothing new. You just have to say, well, negative b over 2a, if I can remember the quadratic formula, I know the vertex formula. Plug in negative b over 2a, find that value from the equation, plug it into the function, and you will have the k value. Let's actually see an example of an application where we can use this tool. All right, in this application, we're told that at a particular restaurant, the cost to assemble a children's combo meal 
is c of x equals 2x squared minus 4x plus 4. We see it's a parabola. Now, this parabola is not in the form we want. I, don't, I can look at it and say, well, I know a is 2, but I don't know h and k. Well, if we explore this uh, function a little bit more, for this particular application, x represents the units of 100 meals. So for every 100 meals, I would have an input of 1x. The output, or the cost, of our function is in units of 100. So if I have 100 units of x, I'm going to get 100 units of uh, the cost, c of x. So the question asks us, find the minimum cost and the number of meals assembled to minimize the cost. Well, the minimum, if we recall, is the y value. We want to find where c of x equals k. And where does that occur is you know, the number that have to be assembled to minimize the cost. And that's a key in business that we want to do all the time. We want to minimize our cost. Here's where we use parabolas to do that. And we can use the vertex formula. So the, the number that minimizes the cost is where x equals the h value. So what we have to find are h and k of this function that is not written in the form where we can just look at it and pull it out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the vertex formula. Well, I know that h is negative b over 2a, that first part of the quadratic equation. So if I find these values, I just identify, well, b is a negative 4. So negative b would be a positive 4. 2 times a, well, a is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 divided by a 4 is 1. I found the h value. I found the axis of symmetry. I found a lot of information with this little piece here. Essentially, what I found is x equals the h value, the number of meals assembled to minimize the cost. I found that value. So there has to be 100 meals. Did I answer the full question, though? Not yet, because it said find the minimum cost. Now, to find the minimum cost, that's our k value, the minimum. Well, if I'm going to find that minimum, all I have to do is plug in this value of 1 that I found for the number of meals. So if I put in 1 here, I'm evaluating the function for the h value. 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2. 1 times negative 4 is negative 4 plus 4. Well, if we simplify that, c of 1 equals 2. This is the k value. It occurred at 100 meals. So k is essentially evaluating the cost function at 1. And we ended up with 2. Well, recall here, the cost is in units of $100. So this would be 2 hundred dollars. So essentially, what we found here was if I assemble 100 meals, I will minimize my cost to be $200. And if we think about it even further, that's $2 per meal. And so that might lead us to say, hey, we have to charge this much in order to make even more money or something of that nature. It is has lots of applications to business. So hopefully we realize that all we really found were the h value and the k value in units of 100 each. So 100 uh, meals gives me $200 to minimize my cost. So this has been section 7.5. And uh, hopefully you're going to practice these, do your own applications, work through these problems, review completing the square, and Put that uh, vertex formula to memory. This, again, this has been section 7.5. Thank you for watching.